Welcome back. Let's continue here now. Former UN Executive Director of Women is engaging the Generational Leadership Youth Conversation. Let's listen in. We have had the challenges we have faced, but more than anything else, what we still have to do. Even though I am a gogo, as Akona would know, they now think that I'm going to be their permanent babysitter. <laughs> I also am conscious that the work is not done. We still have a lot of work ahead of us, and I don't have the luxury of just laying back and not doing anything. But I I'll just would like to have an opportunity now to choose things I'd like to do. And for not deploying a Makaban. I just want to choose the things I can give my energy to and hopefully do my best in that uh, regard. I also want to thank all the speakers and highlight my mother uh, who left us earlier this year, Dem COVID. And wish that she and many others that we lost in this period are in a better place. My maternal family, the Ngobos, the family that my mother comes from, has been special in my life. I see my cousin, Umo Sambeke, is here for that part of my family. And it has been hard for all of us because when we lost her, in that family, but I know many of you are dealing with the same issues. So we don't have the possibility to mourn our loved ones the way we would like to because not only were we not with them, not only could we not touch them, we also were all thinking about staying alive in that moment. Hopefully there will be time and place for us to come together and to mourn. But what is left for all of us is the mental health problems that will arise out of this pandemic. We have more orphans now. We have more widows. We have more breadwinners. I mean, families that have no breadwinners. Ichemors, as Tomato would say. <laughs> and we almost have to rethink how we engage in this new situation. And I hope that all of us will be able to rise up to the occasion and deal with these new circumstances. I'm not even going to the investment challenges and all other issues that we face. I'm just saying ourselves, in our families, and in our small uh, communities, we have this big challenge. I have chosen that my next big project is education, going back to where I started. Yes. I am particularly committed to digital literacy because that's the future of our children. Uh, when I wanted to start to work on digital literacy, I was hoping that I would work directly with students. But as I started my research, I found out that, hey, the biggest problem is teachers. Yeah. We have to sort out the teachers, bring them on board, enable them to master technology so that they would find it easy to assist the children. So that is a big part of my life uh, right now. And of course, also working on leadership. And even though my, the work I do on leadership is ma mainly in schools and mainly with principals, we just have a leadership crisis everywhere. So I'm also aware that I cannot just confine myself just within the schools. I have to reach out everywhere I can. 
we need a new breed of politicians. We need a new breed of politicians. Don't abandon us, young people. Niti Simoshil, Sekolisa. You have to be present because this is your future. This is your country. And without you, we will not be in a position to get it right. So for us who have had the opportunity to be in leadership role, if there's anything at all that we can share with you on how we could fix this, count me in. But we want you to be present and to promise us that you'll help us to deliver ourselves out of the mess that we are in. It was so wonderful to hear about the stories of my past because in the last eight years, the people at the UN were almost thinking that all I've ever done is to work for the UN. I kept on saying, can't deny any life besides this one. <laughs> so it was actually nice to sit here and just go down memory lane and see people I haven't seen for such a long time, hear about the stories of women in mining, see and hear from the people that we were with in the education struggles. It really is very fulfilling. Tomato asks me, how did I raise 40 billion US dollars? Because of you. The one important thing for me when I got to UN Women, and I looked at the budget of my organization, I said, the UN is not serious. Is this all? for half the population of the world with all and the worst problems that we have. This is all the money we have. And I remembered President Mbeki before I left. She said, hey, who's all born? Who <laughs> blind <laughs> And when I saw that, I knew, yeah, I was in trouble. And the UN, I mean, UN agencies in general are funded by member states. And most member states talk very positively about gender equality, but they're not willing to pay for it. They actually think that you can deliver gender equality on the side. And getting the money to invest in the work that needs to be done is not their priority. You see it not just in the UN, you see it in what they do in their own countries. Most of the countries, including South Africa, when it comes to work that has to be done by women, you are lucky if the ministry that deals with women has 10% of the budget that they need to do the work they've been mandated to do. So my fight was not for my organization, it was the fight for the women and girls of the world, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. And it has taken me eight years of laboring. Yes, we steadily increased our budget in UN, as UN women, but I was concerned that I need to leave this organization in a healthier space, but I need to leave the world in a healthier space. And therefore, I worked inclusively because I wanted to tell everybody, you are not working for UN women, you are working for yourselves. Uh, I reached out. It was important to me to bring all these different stakeholders to be part of the journey to gender equality because I also realized that we're actually a very small organization. We were punching above. If people thought that you were seeing us everywhere, it was because we had to show up everywhere, punching above our weight and making sure that everybody feels that this is their issue and they can make a difference. And so number one, work inclusively. And make the people you are working with to own the problem and the solution. Secondly, I wanted to accelerate the pace of change because gender equality has been slow. If you think of the year 1995 in Beijing, and what we promised the women of the world we would deliver for them, and what we've delivered, 
we are no, nowhere near delivering what we promised. There are pockets of excellence, countries and places where a lot of work has been done, but there are countries where it is difficult. And classical examples are countries where there is religious authority and traditional authority in particular. And there are countries where these forces have a strong hold of the countries. There are countries where the laws that discriminate against women are dominant. So one of, and if your laws, if your rights are not protected in law, forget it. You have to create an ecosystem where your rights will be reflected. So changing the laws of countries to make them gender neutral or enacting laws to advance gender neutral, uh, gender equality was my priority. In a year, we used to do about 700 laws. Can you believe this is what we've been doing in eight years and we're no more near ending it? We still have to maintain the momentum to bring about change. In addition, once we've changed the laws, it doesn't mean they will be implemented adequately. You know about your own country. So you have to change the laws and you still have to work to put the infrastructure for the laws to be implemented. But it's important to change the laws. Secondly, I mean, whatever, thirdly, fourthly, you also have to make sure that the people who are making these changes, who are passing the laws in parliament, etc., it's not just women. Because the parliament is not made up of women. It's men and women. Men have a responsibility to create an enabling legal system in their countries. So you really have to make sure that they are there, they stay with you. If you have to draft a bill, push it forward, you have to work at midnight, get up in the morning, they have to be there to do that work. And when you go from country to country, pushing the men and women of those countries, it can be very hard. But we moved forward and we pushed. And thank you to many of you who have helped, both in passing the laws, some of them here in South Africa, and we're not done in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Because we have to clean the slate. They cannot be a country that have a law has a law that discriminates against women. And 25 years after 1995 is too long, South Africa. We have to finish this job. We have to finish this. In South Africa, I feel we have no excuse not to finish because we do have a relatively enabling environment, even though there's a lot of lip service, but we are much better than many countries. So it's important those that are in a better position run faster because you lift up everybody. Countries that have got the means, the money or other means to make the changes, they should get a, go ahead and, and, and make it happen. I always say when I talk to Iceland, you must reach gender equality before everyone else because you are already ticking so many good boxes. It's important that we have, we've got a breakthrough because right now there's not a single country that has achieved gender equality. I mean, don't lond. Anyway, so not only then was I concerned about acceleration, I was also concerned about making sure that as we come out of COVID, we are institutionalizing because when COVID hit, the game changed. We had planned generation equality before COVID, but when COVID came, we actually had to put in place something that would also respond to COVID. And the critical thing in COVID was fiscal stimulus. Are they addressing the needs of women? Gender-based violence, are we putting in place both the preventative as well as interventions that can deal with the violence as it happens. And then of course, I was concerned about digital literacy of women and girls, because the digital gender gap was widening in some parts of the world. And with COVID, it was clear that if we don't fix it, many women and girls will not have a future. 
we will emerge after COVID in a worse position than we were before COVID. So not only do we have to accelerate digital literacy in schools, we have to accelerate it in society. So if you're talking about informal education or education out of school, please include gender literacy. Because if women do not acquire these skills, they will not be in a position to benefit in what is going to emerge in the future. So it's, it's been that rough journey, but the joy of it has been young people. In generation equality, we brought in young people because it was intergenerational. In fact, the bringing in of young people and positioning them at decision making has been a game changer in the struggle for gender equality because they are radically impatient and that helps. It has been helpful because they have not experienced what we have experienced, but they look at us and they say, sure, as funufana na lab. There is no way we are going to be like them. And you need many more to feel that way and to act that way to bring about the changes. So from 10 year olds to 100 year olds, together we are generation equality. At the center of this generation equality is the young ones. But the older ones, we have to bring our shoulders for them to stand on our shoulders while we continue to do the work. And we must co-create the future that we want. We are generation equality because it has to be in this generation that we must score major breakthroughs. 2030 is the highlight of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. By the time in our own a development plan in South Africa. By the time we get to 2030, I am a daughter. I We have the resources to some extent, not enough because 40 billion is still not enough for the work that we have to do. But let us use it in the best way possible to start an irreversible trend. Because what has also been frustrating about women is that we achieve amazing goals, but they are reversible. Right now, we are asking from all of you that we make the changes that will last and will be deep. So when you see things that you have to choose from doing, think about, is this reversible? Is what I'm doing right now uh, at risk of being pushed aside, kicked away in another situation. If it is, don't waste your time. Try to entrench the changes that we need to do. This is what we want to achieve in generation equality. And thank you for giving us a start, for being there. It's been painful to work there, but it's also been a pleasure to give it my all with the support that I've received from many of you. Thank you. Very strong words there from Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nuga. She appealed to the youth to join politics, saying that we need a new breed of politicians. Of course, the former UN executive of women was addressing generational youth conversation at her homecoming event here in South Africa. She also spoke a lot about her time at the UN headquarters in uh, New York about the difficulty of raising funds and says that there's still a lot of work to be done in the uh, gender equality space. Um, there's still a lot of inequality in as far as women are concerned and uh, appealing again you know, to leaders uh, you know, to come forth with, with tangible uh, and strong uh, policy in as far as that is concerned. Of course, uh, the big um, conversation there with her uh, or from her is saying to the youth, we need a new breed of politicians as, of course, as we head to the elections in a couple of weeks time.
Well, from me, Unati Bagyashe, as well as the rest of the SA Today team, Sisi Kamnandi.